Hi, welcome to the CBT Nuggets Linux series. My name is Perry and I'm going to guide you through the process of learning Linux. Now if you've used Linux before that's great. We'll brush up on the fundamentals and I'll work to expand your knowledge in areas that you're not so familiar with. But if you haven't used Linux yet that's okay too because we're going to cover everything from the ground up. What we're going to do is in the first couple videos we'll cover the fundamentals of Linux. Everything from logging into the system to navigating through various menus and directories to editing files. And we'll also talk about the history of Linux a little bit. Now some of the stuff that we cover in the first two videos we'll cover again later in more detail but I just want to get you going. And then in the next few videos we'll talk about the installation process. We'll talk about some pre-installation considerations and we'll actually do a basic installation of Red Hat Linux. In the remainder of the videos we'll move on and go over everything from administration of a Linux system to troubleshooting problems that you run into. Now my goal in this video series is to get you familiar with Linux so that you can efficiently use or run a Linux system whether it's in your home or at a university or a corporation. And you should also find this series helpful if you're trying to pass the CompTIA Linux Plus exam. I've made an effort to cover the objectives for that exam in an order that makes sense. We don't just go through the topics one by one like some books but instead I'm focused on putting together a cohesive set of lectures that flow from one topic to the next. Alright enough of this introduction. Let's get started and actually log into the system. All right, well let's start right at the beginning just by logging into our system. The first thing that we do is just type our username and my username on this machine is Perry and then I hit enter and now I type in my password. And you can see my password just shows up as a bunch of stars. That's just so someone looking over my shoulder can't read my password. Then I hit enter and now I'm actually logging into the system. Uh, down here you can see it says starting GNOME. GNOME is the name of my desktop environment. That just controls the look of the graphical user interface uh, that, that I'm using to interact with the operating system. Now the first thing that pops up here uh, is going to be the start here window. Uh, okay so here you can see it says start here, the, the title of the window is start here and it just gives you some basic icons at, at a, like just a starting point to interact with the uh, operating system. So we can look at the programs that we can run by double clicking on this icon here and you can see uh, that there's applications, that's one subcategory, there's internet programs, multimedia programs, various utilities and you can poke around in here to see the kinds of programs that you can run uh, through the graphical user interface. So I'm just going to double click on applications and you can see the applications that come up here. Uh, Abby Words, a word processor, there's an address book and a calendar, there's an Emacs text editor that we'll talk about later in the video, uh, G-Edit is a very simplistic editor kind of like Notepad on Windows, uh, Numeric is a spreadsheet program, Nautilus is a file manager and, and the, the way that you would run these applications is just by double clicking on the icon. Now another way to run these applications is by going down to this thing down here that looks like a foot. It also looks like a G. It's just kind of like the footprint of a gnome. So for the gnome desktop environment you're going to have this gnome footprint down here. You single click on that main menu item and then you go to programs, applications and now you can see all these things listed in this menu. Well the things listed in this menu are the exact same things that are listed in this window. So you can either run these programs by double clicking on the icon in the window or by single clicking on any of these items in this menu. It's just a, a different approach to do it. Okay, so let's go use the back button here to go back to the main uh, start here window. And now what I want to show you is just double clicking on preferences, what that does. Actually, before I do that, let me just show you uh, some basics of, of Windows stuff in case you haven't used the windowing operating system before, which I would find uh, completely surprising. But in case you haven't, if you left click on this blue title bar up here and hold down the left button and move your mouse around, you can uh, move the window around. If you click on this button over here, this dash, that'll just minimize your window and it just shows up as a box down here in the bottom. If you click on that box then the window pops back up on the screen. Uh, if you click on this button that will enlarge the window to full screen size or if you click on it when it is full screen size that will bring it back to normal size. If you click on the X button here that will just remove the window altogether from, from, your, uh, from your screen. It won't be there at all. I won't click on that now just because I, I want to use this window. Okay. Uh, if you do click on it and you get rid of it with the X you can always get it back by double clicking on this start here icon on the desktop or by single clicking on the start here icon down on the panel. Okay. So that's how you can get this window back if you do remove it and you want to get it back later. 
Okay, so let's look at preferences now uh, and we'll double click on that and like I said I'm using the GNOME desktop and if I double click on desktop you'll see the kind of stuff I can control there. I can control the background colors instead of that blue background I could have a different color or a picture instead. I can control what's in the panel and that's all this stuff down here. What icons are there? What programs those icons run? I can set up things about the screensaver like uh, how much idle time before the screensaver comes on. What screensaver does come on when it, when it, when it uh, launches. Um, the theme selector is just a look and feel kind of uh, thing. You can play around with that if you want. And then there's the window manager I can set. So really the desktop environment in combination with the window manager is what controls the look and feel of this graphical user interface. So if I double click on this, I can set my window manager. And you can see uh, I have the Sawfish window manager, my current one. I could change that to TWM. There's other window managers out there that you can install on your system. Uh, you know, and basically the, the window manager in combination with the, uh, the desktop environment controls this look and feel. And uh, you can see I can run the configuration tool for Sawfish to change the look and feel of things. I'm going to show you how to do that later a different way, so I'm just going to cancel right now. But basically, uh, you know, this, this look and feel, this might throw you a little bit if you're trying trying to follow along on the videos. Uh, maybe the icons look different or maybe the, uh, the selections in some menu are different. Don't let that kind of stuff throw you. That's just you know a, a product of you know what distribution of Linux you're using, what desktop environment you're using, what window manager you're using. And regardless of what choices you've made along the way, you should be able to follow you know 99% of what I'm doing in this video exactly. And, and if some little bit uh, just looks confusing or looks different to you, don't think you're doing anything wrong. Just forge ahead and, and, and you know, don't worry about that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, let's go back another level here and uh, see this Sawfish window manager icon. I'm going to double click on that and now you can see all the various things that I can set in the Sawfish window manager. I can set the appearance of windows. I can set the focus behavior of windows, which just means uh, how does the window become the active window? Do I have to click inside of it? Do I have to click on the title bar? Do I have to just move my mouse anywhere inside the window? That kind of stuff. Okay, that's what you can set by clicking on that icon. You can set the placement of windows. Like where does a new window come, uh, show up when, when you start it? Um, does it show up in the middle of the screen? Does it show up on the left side, the right side, the top, and so on? Okay, so basically if you're using the operating system, you're using this graphical user interface for the operating system, and, and you go to use something and you don't like the way that it works, or you don't like the way that it looks, you know, look around in these, in these icons, in these uh, folders and these directories for a setting for that and, and I'm sure you'll be able to change it and make it so that it's more natural to you and it doesn't annoy you anymore okay so uh, pretty much every facet of the the graphical user interface uh, is customizable and you just need to find uh, the, the particular setting to do that so this graphical user interface that we've seen so far here by pointing and clicking on the various icons, this stuff is getting more and more developed in Linux every day. But this is still not really the standard way to interact with a Linux or a Unix operating system. And instead, the more normal way to interact with this is through a command line interface or a terminal window. So let me just minimize this window here and open up a terminal window to show you what that's all about. So I'll right click on the desktop here in some empty area and then I'll uh, highlight new terminal and I'll left click on that and now I'm opening up a terminal window. Now this terminal window, like I said, it's the more standard way to interact with the Linux operating system. What you're going to do here is type commands uh, from the keyboard and then you know hit enter and then the computer is going to respond with some other sort of text-based answer. Okay, there's not going to be any icons or, or graphs or pointing and clicking. I mean, there are menus here in this window, like I can go to File and open up a new terminal window, or go to Settings and change some preferences for the terminal, okay? But the more standard way to interact with the operating system in Linux is just by typing commands. Now you might say, well, you know, I really like graphical user interfaces. I don't want to do this age-old thing and typing commands. It seems so archaic. But really, um, typing commands in Linux is much more powerful of an interface than the graphical user interface. Uh, it's also more universal. So when I show you something in this uh, terminal window or this command line interface here, that'll work in every version of Linux that's out there. Whereas if I show you some graphical user interface tool for something uh, that Red Hat's developed, then it might not work on every system out there. It might just be a Red Hat specific thing. And I'll let you know when there's a graphical user interface tool out there. I'll show them to you when I can. Uh, and I'll also point out when it is Red Hat specific or, or something like that. So you'll know that it might not be available in every version out there. But everything that I do with the command line interface here, that's going to be uh, uh, applicable, uh, applicable to every version of Linux out there. 
Another reason to use the command line interface and be very familiar with it is because as a system administrator, sometimes you're going to have to work on the system and, and fix things when it's in a state of disrepair, when it's kind of crippled. Okay? And maybe the windowing system isn't working. The windowing system in Linux is called X Windows. So if X Windows isn't working, uh, you're not going to be able to have any sort of graphical user interface to do any kind of diagnostics or, or, or fix things. Okay? So you better be adept at doing all this command line stuff. And you'll see, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of tools and tricks so that using the command line interface is very easy, even if you're not a very good typist, which I'm not at all. Okay? So, uh, so let's, let's get down to it and start learning some commands that we can type in at this command line interface. So PWD is the first one, and that stands for Print Working Directory. So I hit PWD and you can see uh, the working directory that I'm in. And that's the full uh, name of that working directory. Slash home slash Perry is the way that we'll read that. Okay? And, and actually, um, let's talk about this too. This is the command prompt. And this has a lot of information in it. Uh, part of this information actually has to do with this working directory. So here on the very end, let's start there. Uh, this is the directory that I'm currently in. And it doesn't, it's not the whole name. It's not like slash home slash Perry. It's just the very last piece of that name, which is Perry. Okay? So that tells you uh, what directory you're in. Uh, it gives just a succinct way of representing what directory you're in. Now the first part of this prompt up here is what user you're logged in as and also what machine you're logged into. So this is good when you're working over the network or if you're a system administrator and you're changing back and forth from the, what we call the super user or the root account to your normal account. This will let you know which account you're logged into right now, whether you're logged into Perry or, or the root account, which is the administrator's account in Linux. Okay? So, so uh, the prompt tells you a lot of information. The PWD just uh, displays some of that information in a longer form. Now another command that's good to know is the ls command. We use this all the time. And that lists the contents of a directory. So I'm in the uh, slash home slash Perry directory. So if I do an ls, that will list all the directories and files in, in the slash home slash Perry directory. I do that and you can see the only directory I've got so far is this uh, hold directory. Now the hold directory, uh, I can tell this is a directory and not a file because it's blue. And maybe on your version of Linux it's not blue, it's some other color, or maybe they don't do that scheme. And then you just have to know uh, whether it's a directory or, or a file that you're talking about. And we'll talk in later videos how you can determine that if you don't have this nice color-coded uh, scheme, which most versions of Linux actually have this color-coded scheme now. Okay, so that's the ls command to uh, list the, the contents of a directory. Another command is the cd command, which stands for change directory. Now change directory, what you do is you specify the directory that you want to change to after you say cd. So here I'll say cd hold and that'll change my directory one level down into this hold directory. Okay? So I hit enter there and now I do a listing in there and we can see the stuff in that directory. Okay? Uh, there's a couple files in that directory. Another thing that I can do is uh, do a pwd here uh, and you can print your working directory. You can see I'm in slash home slash perry slash hold now. You can also see as soon as I did cd hold, my prompt was different on the very next line. Uh, hold was, was the directory that I was in and again, it's just the very last uh, piece of that directory name that gets displayed inside the prompt. All right, so that's uh, PWD, LS, and CD. Let me just show you another variant of CD here. If you say CD and then you put a space and you say dot dot, that'll move you up one level in this directory hierarchy. So here I'm in slash home slash Perry slash hold. If I say CD dot dot, when I'm done with that command, that'll move me up one level, so I'll be back in slash home slash Perry. Let me hit enter there, and you can see now that my prompt has changed back to Perry because I'm in the slash home slash Perry directory. Now let me show you a couple tips or tricks uh, so that you have an easier time interacting with this command line interface. The first thing I'm going to show you is command completion and then the next thing I'm going to show you is uh, the history function. Okay? So command completion, what that does is it just allows you to complete commands and file names without having to type the entire file name. So here, let me just show you something. So I'm in the slash home slash Perry directory now. I'll do an ls and you can see there's that hold directory there. Now say I want to go down into that hold directory. So I can say cd and I can say h and then if I just hit tab here, then the computer completes the command for me. So that's what command completion is. You hit the tab after you've specified some part of the name and then the rest of the name comes out. So what that does is it just uh, saves me from typing out this name. Now hold is not a very long name, but if that file name was, was much longer uh, and it was the only thing that started with H, I still would only have to type H and hit tab and it would complete the file name. 
So what it does is it completes it as long as it can determine what it is, as long as you've, uh, what you've specified so far allows it to, to finish it in a, some unique way. Okay, so so I'll, let me go into CD. Uh, let me change my directory to hold here and hit enter. And now I'm in the hold directory again. Let me do an ls, and now you can see uh, there's these various Linux syllabus things here. Okay, now um, say I want to do something to one of these files. Let's talk about the uh, copy command. Okay, so CP stands for copy. So I could copy uh, Linux syllabus dot text to a different uh, to a different directory or a different file name or something like that. So copy all it does, it'll leave the original alone and it'll make a new copy of the file to whatever I specify. So here, let me show you how to use uh, command completion within the copy command. So here, let me just type LIN and then I'm going to hit tab. Now notice it went out to Linux syllabus with a period, but then it stopped. Well, the reason it stopped there is because it didn't know how to complete it. It knew once I typed LIN that the next bunch of letters must be UX uh, underscore syllabus because both of the file names in this directory start with Linux underscore syllabus. Okay, so it knew that much, but it doesn't know at the end whether it should be uh, .pdf or .txt. So if I type T now and then I hit tab again, it'll, now it knows exactly how to complete it because that, that specifies it uniquely. So command completion will complete it as far as it can uh, and then if there's some you know, conflict that it doesn't know how to resolve, if there's two files or three files that, that it could be, then it will just stop where, where it has to and let you finish it. Uh, once I type the T, again I hit the tab again and then it was able to complete it because at that point it was unique. So I can copy this to something else. I could just say uh, Linux3.txt or something like that. Okay, so this is the copy command. It leaves the original alone, but it creates a new copy of the file called this, and it'll be in the exact same directory. And I hit enter, and if I do an ls now, you'll see that there's Linux3, Linux, Linux underscore syllabus.pdf, and Linux underscore syllabus.txt. All right, so that's command completion, and that comes in really handy, especially when you're dealing with long file names, and especially if you're like me and you're like a really poor typist, okay? And you don't want to have to type out these really long file names. Uh, command completion just saves you all sorts of keystrokes. Now, another thing that can save you some keystrokes is the history command. So if you hit the up arrow on your keyboard, you'll see the last command that you executed. If you hit the up arrow again, you see the command before that. You hit the up arrow again, you see the one before that. You hit the up arrow again, the one before that, and so on. Okay, so you can just go back and do any one of these commands that you want in the command history. If you want to repeat them exactly, you can do it that way. Or if you want to edit it, um, you can do that as well. So here's this command that I did a couple commands ago. And I can just go back here with the, with the uh, left arrow and change this and then hit the backspace and type in 4. Okay, so I could do another co uh, copy command and create a new file called Linux 4 and all I had to do was hit the up arrow a couple times, go back and change that 3 to the 4 and I didn't have to type this whole command out again. So if you're doing some sort of repetitive task where you're doing the same series of commands over and over and over again, uh, the history function d saves you a, a lot of keystrokes in that regard because uh, you don't have to type these commands out again, you can just hit the up arrow to go back and retrieve some previous command. Well, let's just forge ahead here and talk about some more commands. Actually, I did one while the uh, video was paused. I typed the clear command, which just clears the screen and it, and it just makes it nice. It just reduces all the clutter on the screen so you can see exactly what you're typing and what the output of, of what you're typing is. Okay, so uh, that's the clear command. Um, let's do an ls on the directory again just to see all the files in there. And let me show you a new command called rm, which stands for remove, uh, which basically will just remove or delete a file from, from your uh, directory. Okay, so what you can do with the rm command, uh, actually with uh, most Linux commands uh, like rm, you can actually specify options for the command. So you can specify an option like this, usually with a minus sign and then some letter. So the i here stands for inquire. So the operating system is going to inquire and make sure that we want to remove the file that we're specifying. So if I say something like this and then say linux3.txt, okay, this is going to remove linux3.txt from, from, the, from the directory here, but it's going to ask me first and double check and make sure that I really want to remove that. And, and later I'll show you how to make the minus i option uh, sort of permanent for RM so that you can't just you know delete a file accidentally and, and then it'll be a real pain to get it back. You'll have to get it off some backup tape or something. Like when you remove it, it's not like in a trash can or something like that where you can uh, retrieve it later. It's really off the system for good and, and it's going to be a big pain in the butt to try and get it back. 
Okay, so I'll hit enter here, and now what it says is, do you really want to remove Linux 3.txt? And if I say Y here, or I can type yes, or something like that, uh, and hit enter, then uh, that, that file is now removed. And if we do an ls, you'll see that file Linux 3.txt is gone. Now another useful command to learn is the move command, mv. Uh, and what that does is it moves a file from one name to a different name. So uh, some people call this the rename command because all it really does is rename a file. You, you lose the old copy of the file, unlike the copy command that retains the old name and just creates a new one. Move gets rid of the old one and just leaves, leaves the new name or the new version of the file. Okay, so here I can say something like this. I, I'll say LIN, I'll hit tab, and it completes it as far as it can. I'll hit T and hit tab again. So now I'm moving Linux syllabus.txt, and I'll just move it to uh, Linux.txt or something like that. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to remove this file, Linux syllabus.txt, and really just rename it to Linux.txt. So I'll hit enter here and I'll do an ls again and now you can see there is no Linux syllabus.txt anymore that now it's just called Linux.txt. So that's what the move command does. And let me just show you a couple more things here. Uh, the make directory and the remove directory commands I want to show you. So uh, let's make a directory under the hold directory here. If I print working directory again you'll see I'm in slash home slash peri slash hold. And if I do an mkdir and say uh, uh, just temp or something like that. So I make this directory called temp and I do a listing now. You'll see that the files are in here, Linux syllabus and Linux.txt, but there's also a directory under here now called temp. All right, and I can go into that directory with the cd command. I can do an ls and see that nothing's in there. Um, I can cd out of that directory by saying cd dot dot, and now I'm back in the hold directory. Okay, so that's the make directory command. Uh, once we learn how to edit files and create files, you can put files into those directories that you create. Uh, then there's also the remove directory command to get rid of directories. Uh, if the directory has something in it, you will not be able to remove it. You'll have to remove all the files inside of it first and then uh, remove the directory itself. And that's just kind of a precaution. Uh, you, you don't want to be able to remove some directory accidentally and then all of a sudden uh, I don't know, you've deleted all these important files. So that way it just makes sure that you've deleted all the files first, then you're allowed to remove the directory. Well, since I haven't put anything into temp yet, I'll be able to remove it with the remove directory command, and I'll just say it like this, remove directory temp, do that, and now when I do a listing, you'll see that there is no temp directory under the hold directory. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about text editors. There's two major text editors available to you in Linux, the Emacs editor and the VI editor. And you know, there's a bit of a religious debate about which one's better and which one people prefer. I want no part of that debate. I'm just going to show you both of the editors and you can decide for yourself which one you'd rather use. You at least have to know the basics of the VI editor because in certain circumstances that's going to be the only editor available to you on the system. Uh, for instance, if your uh, hard disk has crashed and you need to boot off of a floppy copy disk and try and fix your hard disk, well the only editor that's going to be available to you in that circumstance is the VI editor because the program, the VI editor program is much, much smaller than the Emacs program and it'll fit on the floppy with all the stuff that you need to boot your system. So the VI editor is better in that circumstance and so you at least need to know the basics of it uh, for that reason and I'll show you the basics of both of them and then you can learn them at, at your, on your own time and sort of see which one you like better. Okay, so uh, let's start with the Emacs editor. And the way I'm going to launch it is go down to here, the main menu, go to Programs, Applications, Emacs. So I can click on this, or I could just type Emacs at the command line in the terminal window, all lowercase, and that would start up the Emacs window as well. All right, so I'll start up the Emacs editor, I'll click on this, and now this is the Emacs window that comes up here. And you can see it's running off the right-hand side of the screen. That's just because uh, my screen resolution is set so low for recording these videos. I'm just going to click on this button so that it all fits in one screen and you can see everything all at once. Okay, so this area right here would be the text of the file that you're editing or creating. Down here would be the name of the file. Uh, right now you can see it, see it just says scratch. That just means this is the scratch buffer. It's kind of like an introduction window for Emacs. And then down here where it says for information about the GNU project, uh, down there is what, th there would be various commands and things. You'll see, you'll see what I mean in, in a little bit. So let's talk about these menus up here. Uh, the buffers, that's the name of, of each of the windows or files that you have open. That's, that's the term that we use. You can see there's a scratch buffer. Um, and if we had some file open, that file would be listed in this menu as well. 
Uh, then there's a file menu to open a file, save a file, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's tools, there's search mechanisms so you can search through a file. And then there's this help menu as well. And let's talk about this one now. Uh, there's an Emacs tutorial entry in that help menu. So you could click on that to run the Emacs tutorial. I'm not going to walk you through the tutorial because it's very self-explanatory and it's a very well written tutorial. So you can go through that and basically it's just kind of a learn by doing tutorial. So they'll just walk you through all the basic stuff you want to do with Emacs. Um, let me talk a little bit about what this thing over here on the right means. This C-H -H space T. This is a shortcut to enter the Emacs tutorial. So instead of having to use the mouse and go up to the help screen and, and scroll down to tutorial and click on it, you can just type control H so that's what the capital C stands for is control. So you hold down the control key and you hit the H key. You let go of everything and then you hit the T key. So control H T is the way that we say that. And that will get you into the tutorial without having to use the mouse at all. Uh, down here uh, you can notice that there's capital C's which represent control and there's lowercase c which just represents the C key on the keyboard. So this one the way we would say it is control H control C and for that we would hold down the control key and hit H, let go of everything, hold down the control key and hit C and that would execute this command. Okay, uh, let's look for another couple shortcuts. Um, here's, here's a good one because it shows you what the M, that, that there's an M key shortcut. So M here stands for meta. And the meta key is typically the alt key on the keyboard. Uh, sometimes on older keyboards it was the escape key. Uh, nowadays most keyboards the meta key is the alt key. So here what we're going to do is hold down the meta key and press period. All right. And then down here at the bottom you can even see there's one uh, with a control and a meta. So this one you're going to ho hold down the control key and the meta key and hit the percent key. And that's going to do this query replace thing. Uh, this is basically like a search and replace mechanism in Emacs. All right, so that's the basics of how you navigate around the menus uh, and, and how, what, the, what these various shortcuts mean. Now let's open a file. Actually, let's create a file from scratch. So we're going to open a file. Uh, we use this. We can either say Control X, Control F, or we can click on this menu item. I'm just going to click on the menu item since I already have it open. And now down here at the bottom it says Find File. It says Tilde, then Slash. Now tilde, that represents my home directory. So for me, that means slash home slash Perry. For you, that would mean something different. But whatever user you're logged in as, tilde just represents your home directory. All right? And now what I can do is I can specify some file name in my home directory. And actually, a command completion works down here. So if I just type HO, for instance, and then hit tab, it completes it to the hold directory. Okay, so I can, you know, I can use command completion right down here in the Emacs window. And let's just create a new file called silly.txt. So I'm going to hit enter here to create this file. And you can see now it says new file. If this file silly.txt already existed in the hold directory, then the text of it would be up here and, and it wouldn't say new file. Okay, so let's just create this file. Let's, let's type a couple things. This is a silly file, something like that. Um, what do you think? Uh, if I could type it, there we go. And, and there's, there's some uh, information in the file now. And now if we want to save this file, we can go under Files and go to Save Buffer. And that's going to save this file as silly.txt. Okay, so I'm going to click on Save Buffer. Also notice the shortcut, Control X, Control S. Okay, so I'll click on that. And now you can see down here it says wrote slash home slash Perry slash hold silly.txt. Now we've created this file and, you know, and it's saved. Okay, so, so that's the basics of the Emacs editor. Let me just show you a few more things. Um, you can always move around with the uh, arrow keys to move back and forth, to move up and down, that kind of stuff. You can also click with your mouse to go to various places in, in here uh, to, uh, to delete and edit and add stuff to the, to the, uh, to the file. Okay, so, so that's the basics. Let, let me just show you a couple more. Control A always brings you back to the beginning of a line. And then Control E always takes you to the end of a line. And if you walk through the tutorial, you'll learn those shortcuts like Control A and Control E. You'll also learn things to like kill an entire line or cut and paste a big section of text. All that stuff will be covered in the tutorial. So let's just exit out of this Emacs window now. And one way that we can do that is go under Files to exit Emacs, or we can use the shortcut Control X, Control C. I'm just going to click on this menu item, and that'll end our Emacs session. Um, Oh, and now it's saying, uh, do you want to save this file? I guess I've, I've changed it since the last time I saved it. So it's making sure that I want to save this. So I, yes, I do want to save it. And now it exits me out of Emacs. And now let's talk a little bit about the VI editor. 
So to use VI, let's get our uh, terminal window back up here and type VI at the command line is one way that you can get into it. Actually first let's go down into the hold directory and you can see in here there's that file silly.txt and let's edit that with the VI editor. Actually you can see another file here too called silly.txt with a tilde after it. This is kind of like an older version of this file. In some sense it's like a, a backup copy. Um, and, and so if you made some change and you screwed something up in there and, and you were upset about those changes, well you can usually go back to the previous version by you know looking getting this file and then you know renaming this file to this one. Okay, so uh, this is the newest version and this is the old version, the one with the tilde. So let's edit that file silly.txt. Okay, and we'll say vi silly.txt and hit enter. And now we're in the vi editor and there's the text of the file. Okay, now what you need to know about vi first is that there's three modes and vi is in one of these three modes at any time. Uh, there's command mode that you can e execute commands like to insert stuff or delete lines, things like that. Then there's x mode uh, and the x mode uh, is, is like what you use when you're going to write the file and quit out of the file, that kind of stuff. And then there's edit mode when you're actually uh, changing stuff, when you're like adding text to the file. Okay, so if you're ever unsure of what mode you're in, if you just hit the escape key, then you'll go to command mode and you, and you can start over from command mode. Now what you are is we're in command mode right now. You can move around the file with the arrow keys, okay. Uh, you cannot point and click in here, all right. So v, the VI editor here is not like a point and clickable sort of editor. It's all text based. Everything you do is going to be based on keystrokes. There's no menus to, to use like Emacs had and there's no, uh, you know, it's, it's a much more primitive editor. Like I told you before, it's a much smaller program and the reason that it's a smaller program is because everything is, is uh, based on keystrokes that you enter at the keyboard. All right, so uh, so let's let's do something to this file. Let's enter insert mode. So the way that we're going to enter insert mode is just by typing an I while we're in command mode. And we're in command mode right now. When you go into the file, you're in command mode. And remember, like I said, you can always hit the escape key to go back to command mode. So I'll hit an I, and now you can see down at the bottom it says insert. So now we're in in in, in the insert mode, uh, and now we can do things like say, okay, this is a really silly file. And then we can go to the end of the line. Uh, we can hit the delete key to get rid of stuff and just you know put some exclamation marks there and this is what insert mode means if I hit an enter now you can see everything kind of moves down a line all these tildes that run down the left hand side are just markers uh, just kind of like to represent that these lines don't really exist in the file okay now what I'm going to do is hit escape again and now I'm back to command mode. If I want to save these changes, then what I can do is type shift colon. Now you can see uh, the colon shows up down at the bottom and I could hit WQ to write my changes and quit. Okay, if I just want to write my changes, I could just hit a W there and hit enter. And now it says silly.txt, four lines, 56 characters has been written. So there, now the file's saved. I could do some more changes to it and, and so on. Okay, so, so that's basically, uh, you know, the, the basics of VI. If you want to do something like, you know, delete a whole line of text, you can just hit DD here. And then the, the, um, the whole line of text disappeared. So while we were in command mode, you hit DD and that whole line of text disappeared. All right, so that's the kind of things that VI has. It has all these little shortcuts like DD to delete a line and, and, and you can put numbers in there to delete more lines and just, you know, find a tutorial on VI, look at the man page for VI and you'll learn all the various shortcuts. And like I said, uh, the most important thing to remember is that, you know, you hit escape key and you go to command mode and then to save any sort of changes that you make, uh, you hit shift colon while you're in command mode. WQ would write your changes and quit out. If you just want to quit quit without writing, you have to hit Q and exclamation mark. So that will uh, quit you out of the VI editor and it won't save any of your changes. It'll revert you back to what was there before uh, in case you did something catastrophic, you, you changed something, you don't remember how to change it back, then just quit out with the exclamation mark, Q exclamation mark, it'll stop, it'll just revert all your changes back to what it was before you entered the editor. Okay, so I'm just going to do a WQ here to write my changes and quit and hit enter and now I'm out of the VI editor. And now if we do something like cat uh, silly.txt and cat's just a command that prints out stuff to the screen, it prints out a text file to the screen. So if I just hit enter, now you can see uh, the new file. So it says this is a really silly file and there's no more stuff down here that says what do you think, we deleted that. Okay, so that's the basics of the VI editor, and like I said, you just need to pick which one you which one you want to use uh, when your system's up and functioning. There's plenty of people that use VI, there's plenty of people that use Emacs, but you at least need to know the basics of VI, remember, for when your system is in some sort of state of disrepair. 
All right, well, it's time to wrap up our first video on using Linux. Uh, we started by logging into the system, which is a really simple process, and then we talked about various commands. Uh, the ls command to list the contents of a directory. cd, change directories. Um, the move command, which basically renamed a file to a different name. Uh, the remove command, which deleted a file. The copy command, which copied a file to a new name, but it left the original intact. And, and we threw some other ones in there, like the cat command to print out a file. And basically, you know, all these commands are, are um, available to you can find out all about these commands in the man pages and the info pages, which we're going to talk about in the next video. And you can just learn about the commands and the various options for the commands. Remember, for the remove command, we did that thing where we said rm with minus i before we removed the file. Well, this minus i uh, is an option for rm. Rm has other options. Most of these, uh, most every Linux command has options that you can use with it. And the man pages and the info pages are going to tell you all about those various options. And like I said, we'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, then we finally wrapped up with some discussion of editors, the VI editor and the Emacs editor. And, you know, just pick whichever one is more natural to you, whichever one seems more natural. Use that one. And remember, you got to at least keep, uh, you know, brushed up at least with the basics of VI for those circumstances when you're not going to be able to run Emacs. Well, I hope you found this nugget informative and thanks for watching.